doing, you know, hit intervals and getting my heart rate up, if I could talk to someone, I was fine. And, and I, that pregnancy was a lot easier to recover from. Um, I was back in the gym about five weeks after. And um, the first one, it took me over 12 weeks just to be able to walk without pain. If you think you're having a hard time lifting today, try doing it with another 20 to 30 pounds on you or a seven to eight pound person inside of you. As healthcare providers, we're afraid of pregnant women and often place undue limitations on them when it comes to fitness and nutrition. Recent changes in the literature suggest that movement and not bed rest are the way to go when it comes to these extraordinary women. Today at the Maximal Being Fitness, Nutrition, and Gut Health podcast, we discuss superhuman pregnancy physiologic change, the implications of this in high-risk situations, what exercises not to do when you're pregnant, and the new research on exercise in pregnancy. We also discuss practical applications with the strongfigure.com team and variability when it comes to each individual pregnancy and each individual baby. Finally, we talk about nutrition and cravings and how sometimes the baby's just going to tell you exactly what you can and cannot do. So listen on, Maximal Beings, to today's podcast. Do us a favor, Maximal Beings, and leave us a comment or review. Hit the subscribe button and let your friends and family know so that we can get the word out. You cannot supplement your way to health, but there are things that we need to add to our lives that can maximize our pathway to wellness. The American diet is virtually devoid of omega-3 fatty acids, which play a major role in cardiovascular disease, gut permeability, and mental health. Personally, I take omega-3s every night and iHerb is the best place for clean, natural sources of supplements. I love the Zenwise omega-3 fatty acid supplement, which is free of fish burps and good for the environment. Head on over to MaximalBeing.com slash iHerb, that's I H. ERB and enter the code B is in boy, D is in dog, B is in boy, 5528 and receive 10% off your orders for all supplements. Maximize your supplements with iHerb. Welcome to Maximal Being, a GI doc and ICU nurse that break down the science so you can exceed your gut health nutrition and fitness goals. So let's smash the bro science and optimizing your health with your hosts, Doc Mock and RN Graham. What's going on, Maximal Beings? It's Doc Mock here and RN Graham with the Maximal Being Fitness, Nutrition and Gut Health Podcast. Today, I am so excited to have two guests with the strongfigure.com, founders of the Strong uh, Figure Bootcamp and experts in terms of uh, making you fitter, right from home, uh, Stephanie Walker and Caitlin Tice. Um, Today, we're also going to talk in the context of what can you do to continue your fitness journey during and after pregnancy. Now, a little disclaimer, RN Graham and myself are both licensed, board certified healthcare providers. But uh, that said, you know, we do recommend here at MaximalBeing.com that you always consult with your healthcare provider prior to implementing any major changes in terms of um, your health and wellness. So that said, uh, I'm Doc Mock. I'm a advanced GI provider here in Cleveland, Ohio. That's a doctor that deals mostly with cancer. I do fancy procedures to remove cancers, diagnose them in early stages. And I also specialize in nutrition and gut health. And joining me as always is my partner in crime, the man who's managing 100% FIO2 at 0% body fat, RN Grip. Hello, Maximal Beings. It's R.N. Graham here. Uh, ICU nurse down here in South Florida. I currently work in the uh, COVID unit. I am also an ex-fitness competitor uh, with the National Physique Competition. Um, And as always, enjoy uh, joining Doc Mock for another podcast. And we do have two fantastic guests. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Stephanie. Um, Hi, so I'm Stephanie, and uh, my background uh, basically does not always include fitness. Um, I grew up not knowing how to implement a healthy lifestyle, um, you know, into what I was doing in life. And so uh, fitness hasn't always come easy for me. And 
when I had graduated college, I had gained a lot of weight and I really struggled to figure out how to lose it. And that's kind of the journey that became strongfigure.com, me trying to help as many people as I could who may also have been struggling with learning how to eat right, exercise, um, you know, everything that everyone's looking to get into. Um, And I feel like that's kind of also what separates me from a lot of other fitness people that you'll see or run into on social media because um, I spent a long time struggling. It wasn't always easy. It wasn't something I just, you know, grew up with. So I had to figure out how to, you know, get fitter, how to lose the weight, how to eat healthier. Um, And then I spent probably 10 or more years in the community helping others, whether it was teaching classes, blogging, um, working at the local rec center, completely changed my career um, from a high school teacher into teaching and coaching fitness and nutrition. And it was probably around the 10 year mark that I got pregnant with my first baby. And that changed my whole view on fitness, especially women's health and fitness. Um, because I thought I knew everything about the female body and how to exercise. And suddenly there was a new being inside me and everything changed. Um, even in all of my certifications, I had never been taught about the pelvic floor, those muscles. Um, I thought I would just exercise all the way up to my due date. I mean, things were just crazy. So it, it excelled my passion for fitness and women's health even further, um, kind of renewed that spirit even. And, um, that was about four years ago. I just had my second baby. He's, he'll be five months on Sunday. And I will have to say that going through pregnancy four years ago versus now, the material that you find out there on pregnancy and fitness, a lot of it is outdated. It's not the right information. Um, a lot of it's even been proven wrong by doctors, but the information hasn't been put forth. So I ended up having two completely different pregnancies because of that experience and two completely recover uh, different recoveries as well, just from the information that is being put out now and and that we're learning about women's health and pregnancy and fitness. So that's, yeah, that's where I am now. And Caitlin and I are working together to get that information out there. Caitlin. Well, hi, I'm Caitlin. um, And I think I actually got into fitness coaching because of Steph. Um, years ago, she mentioned, um, that she was coaching at a local rec center and, um, I was taking her class and she joked one time with me about how, um, you know, when she's not able to be there, she needs a sub or something. I could just fill in for her. And I literally laughed in her face, um, because like fitness was something that I, that I enjoyed, um, but it wasn't something that I felt like I knew enough about. I still feel that way sometimes, Um, but to coach other people and help other people with it. Um, I was a high school volleyball coach for about five years. um, And that was kind of the the fitness coaching world that I had um, started out in. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Loved establishing relationships with the girls, um, building trust, and then being able to encourage them to push themselves to be better. And I think as women, we need to um, be there for each other, build each other up. And that's what I love about coaching. And I think that that is with my experience with being pregnant and having babies um, and going through that postpartum period, learning to um, cope with the stresses of um, figuring out parenting as well. Um, that that's also what got me into pre and post postpartum fitness. Um, and I, I want to be one of the tools in women's toolbox to help them manage those times where it can be so overwhelming in um, pregnancy and postpartum, navigating parenting. Um, I want to be there to be able to walk alongside them and help them navigate that, to be in their corner, to encourage them, um, to put time into their own bodies, not to put pressure on them to get their body back because there's this huge, um, I don't know, push for people to like get their body back, but there's no body to get back to. We're still in that same body. Um, and, and not to put any pressure to look a certain way or anything. Um, but because of self care, um, as moms, we often like shove things aside because we are taking care of everybody else. Um, and so reminding people and helping people see that fitness and exercise and nutrition, um, is key to how a woman feels. And if you feel good in the inside, 
then you'll start to feel good on the outside and, and your the way you feel spreads out to the people around you and you can be a better mom. You can be a better coworker. You can like that spreads out to the rest of um, your life as well. And so I think that's really important to, uh, yeah, focus on that. Uh, that's really well said for both of you. And I, I think you can see a theme here in this podcast that we all kind of help each other. We, we built this positive community, you know, the fitness nutrition industry is so competitive, but, RN Graham and I were, you know, some of the main sparks in, in getting our fitness journey started. S Stephanie with Strong Figure, you know, she got me to that next level of my, my training. And, you know, I, I certainly have been getting my butt kicked by, by Caitlin and Stephanie during COVID a bunch with their amazing home boot camp workouts. I mean, you know, kudos to them for putting such a great program together. But speaking of, um, you know, taking care of everybody except for yourself, from a healthcare perspective, doctors and healthcare providers are scared to take care of pregnant people because you're taking care of two human beings at the same time. In my world, we use x-rays and uh, during some of our key procedures and doctors are really scared to use x-rays on fetuses, even though we know that it's safe. Um, and so I think that that is absolutely true and is the reason why our classical guidelines recommend so much bed rest for women during pregnancy. Let's just go through a few uh, reasons why that may occur in terms of basic physiology changes that happen to women during pregnancy. So there are some changes that are really good, right? Actually, the ability for the heart to pump blood to your organs uh, goes up to superhuman levels. And it's probably because, again, you have to get blood to another human being. Um, so the, the most people will be able to pump out, you know, around 2.5 liters per minute, but it actually doubles during pregnancy and can get as high as seven liters per minute. Um, heart rates can go up, the ability, the amount of uh, pumping power goes up. But with all of that, you ha women have a lot more volume circulating and they have a lot more red blood cells, but not a good ratio of the two. So women may be anemic, relatively speaking, because the volume of fluid is higher. And we're going to talk about this soon with a, a friend of ours, uh, Serge, in an upcoming podcast. But you need red blood cells to deliver oxygen to your tissues, which is so vital during exercise, right? You need a pump that can pump it, and you need a delivery system that can get oxygen to the tissues. So... If those, both of those factors are different, that's why people are skittish to recommend exercise. Also, just the sheer weight of having another human being pushing on your body can limit your GI function. People will get constipated, they'll have gastroesophageal reflux disease and feel nauseated. It can also affect your urinary system, so your ability to get rid of the, that lactic acid and those toxins that build up from exercise can occur as well. Not to mention if you're trying to lie on your back and you have a baby, you can also block off the main blood supply that gives blood back to your heart, all of the, that toxic sort of blood in, in your veins. And so that creates a further limiting factor. So the traditional guidelines up until about a week ago by the American College of uh, Gynecology and Obstetricians actually says that women that have cerv cervical insufficiency a condition called placenta previa, where the placenta hangs in front of the uterus, um, mo multiple kids in there, preterm labor or rupture of their membranes uh, before the time of delivery, um, they should have bed rest. But it turns out maybe that's not the best way to approach things. RN Graham, what do you think about exercise during pregnancy? That said. Well, I've never been pregnant before. <laughs> um, but I, I do have a wife that has been pregnant twice. Um, and I'll tell you, kudos to, to women that hit the gym during pregnancy because it is a rough time period. I remember um, everything she went through because believe me, I, I went through it with her and I would do it again if I had to. Um, but let's face it, for women in general, getting to the gym sometimes can be you know, an uphill task. Um, and one thing that Stephanie said um, was the fact that this bond with Caitlin. Um, and I think in women's fitness, there needs to be more of a bond and the ability to lift each other up to get, you know, the next person into the gym. Um, and doing that pregnant, in, in fact, just stepping into the gym pregnant, 
people's eyes turn. You, you're, it's, it's like you're an alien. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um, when I see it, I'm like, kudos to you. I'm very happy because I understand what these women are trying to do um, with their body. They're trying to do for you know their unborn child. Um, so, like Doc Mock said, there 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 is some science that says okay, you shouldn't do this, and there's science that said that you should do this. Um, and as Stephanie said, what she did four years ago is totally different with, than what she's doing today because it's it's an evolving um, it's an evolving science when it comes to women in pregnancy. Because let's be honest. In the scientific community, if you want to talk about taboo, the woman's body is like taboo. Like, you know, the scientific community, there's it is it was run by men for a long time. And with more and more women getting into the field, we're learning so much more about pregnancy and what needs to be done during pregnancy um, as far as fitness and nutrition goes. Um, but as Doc Mock said, you know, when it comes to certain things. Um, the science says, let's not do this, let's not do that. Once again, I've never been pregnant. Stephanie, did you have any complications or anything like that that kind of made you a little bit wary? And what did you do when you did have these thoughts? Um, my first pregnancy, I was so nauseous the first trimester, I couldn't do anything. Um, the second trimester, I tried to get back into fitness. Um, I had been told not to lift more than 35 pounds, but um, we kind of just laughed about that and moved on. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I had actually been powerlifting right before I got pregnant. And so I was probably the strongest I'd ever been in my life. Um, and so I, I was like, Oh, okay. And then, you know, went back to the gym and continued to deadlift and, and whatever. Um, I did find out that I had, um, an umbilical hernia and I'm guessing I actually got that from powerlifting, but real, you know, pushed it forward where I could feel it. So, lifting became very uncomfortable. Um, and I didn't do much of it, uh, because of my height, my, and the way, I guess my organs were being pushed up in my body, my ribs and my back fused into my spine. And so I had terrible, terrible back pain, upper back pain, which is not usually common. It's usually lower back pain. Well, I didn't have the lower back pain. I had the upper back pain. So everything just kind of, it hurt. It, it didn't go well. Um, I did, I just didn't get to exercise as much as I wanted. Um, things that, you see people doing all the time that are pregnant, like lunges, even without any added weight. I, it just hurt. It didn't feel like it should. And that's one thing that I often find myself telling pregnant women, if your body doesn't want to do something, it won't, you know, if it doesn't feel right, you'll know it. Um, and I can't, ex I can't stress more that when you're pregnant, your gut instincts just really kind of take over. And I knew how much I could deadlift and how much I couldn't, um, with a baby, you know, um, I, I knew my limits and boundaries because my gut would be like, yeah, don't try to lift that. That's, that's too heavy. Um, but I could lift more than 35 pounds, you know? So there's, there's that there's, there's always the listen to your gut component of it. But yeah, the first pregnancy did not go over well. And it was really devastating because you, you're now seeing the push to work out when you're pregnant, you know, it's healthy for you. It's healthy for the baby. And it just didn't work out for me. And it was really mentally um, stressful because that was my life. Um, with my second pregnancy, the only complication I ended up having was, um, well, I had two, but the around week six, seven, um, the weeks that I got really, really nauseous, um, I spotted just a little bit so that I knew that was my body saying, step away from the gym, stop trying to push it. And I did, I didn't work out those two weeks and, until it went away. And later in the pregnancy, about 34 weeks, they thought I was in preterm labor and um, the doctors made me stop working out for two weeks. But once I hit 37, we were like, Let's go, you know, you're good if the baby comes. And um, that was, that was a very different experience. Everyone was like, yeah, you can lift heavier, you can move faster, you can get your heart rate up. Um, I went by the guideline of you should be able to talk, not sing. So if I was doing, you know, hit intervals and getting my heart rate up, if I could talk to someone, I was fine. And, and I, that pregnancy was a lot easier to recover from. Um, I was back in the gym about five weeks after. And um, the first one, it took me over 12 weeks just to be able to walk without pain. So a lot of, a lot of differences there.
Now, Doc Mock, um, it is known that when women do become pregnant, their joints loosen up. Why is this? So it, it has to do with the effects of estrogen and progesterone. They can actually affect um, a, a factor that makes a lot of your joint fluids and so forth called fibroblast growth factor. Um, and that is directly affected by those hormones. So when you're at a high estrogen progesterone state, state it can affect that, making your joints more, more lax. It's also you know, probably an evolutionary advantage to allow or to prepare the body to pass a human being out of it. You know, you need to make things a little more lax. And so that, that is probably why you've developed that, um, you know, hernia during your training with, the, with your pregnancy. You know, also women will get something called diastasis recti, where actually your abdominal muscles, the ones in the front, will pull apart a little bit because there's only so much space, right? And with the connective tissue between them as the only thing separating, getting more lax, it's natural for, pe for people to get some sort of a hernia. Um, you know, we, uh, we did talk about Stephanie's, but I'd like to hear Caitlin's experiences with, you know, lifting as she's also a total badass, you know, through her pregnancies. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I had two also very different pregnancies. Um, the first one, I was sick most of the time, not to the point where I couldn't do anything. Um, and they call it morning sickness for some reason. And I have no idea why, because mine was always in the evening. It got worse throughout the day. Um, and so I, for both pregnancies, I worked out up until the due date. Um, but in order to do that, I had to do it in the morning because I felt the best in the morning. Um, if I waited any longer, I would have no motivation to get to the gym. Um, so I was sick a lot with the first, um, but otherwise no complications. Um, and so I was able to work out. Um, I was taking Steph's class at the local rec center at the time. Um, so the workouts were tough, but not what they are now, <laughs> not what her, she programs now. Um, and so it was really easily manageable. Um, I had to modify some stuff as I got you know, with core, core work and everything, but not a ton. Um, and then with my second pregnancy, I had so much pain everywhere. <laughs> um, in the like, pregnant body parts, like the hips, um, and the back pain and pelvic pain. I mean, it was, it was everywhere. Um, and the same, if I didn't go to the gym immediately in the morning, which is where I, when I felt the best, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it. And so that one I had to modify a lot more. Um, I couldn't do anything split the lunges or whatever box jump or, um, step ups. I couldn't do, I couldn't do box jumps either because I didn't have, um, that's harder when you're pregnant. <laughs> um, so I could do squats because I wasn't, um, split in those, um, anything that kept my hips stable. Um, but really, I mean, other, other than the, the standard core adjustments, um, I was able to work out pretty well, um, even amidst the pain because it didn't get as bad. Um, it wasn't as bad in the morning until later in the day. Um, but both of the recoveries, I would say were fairly similar. Um, I didn't put the same amount of um, effort into my recovery with my first. I, it was a, um, the birth was more challenging. Um, so the recovery, like Steph, couldn't walk much. Um, the first, for my first recovery, yeah, I was um, not quite 12 weeks, but pretty close. Um, for me, um, I was uh, still in pain. Um, and, and I didn't, I didn't have the motivation to get back into the gym. It wasn't until honestly, until Steph all but forced me to come work out when she started strong figure boot camp. Um, and she said, okay, I'm coming to pick you up. And this was 12 months or more postpartum that, so or our kids were over a year old, um, when I got back into the gym. And so I wasn't really aware of where my body was. Um, I had recovered enough when I got back into the gym that it felt like I was back to normal. And it wasn't until I got pregnant again that I realized that, not the damage, but, but what, what happened when I started working out again, I wasn't aware of 
like rehabbing my core because I felt like it was okay. Um, I wasn't aware of the, um, like how maybe I could have worked on my hip strength or my core strength or whatever in order to, to, um, prevent some of the pain that I had had, um, in my pregnancy. Uh, and so second recovery after the second baby was a lot better. I actually started working out, um, in very minimally, almost right away, um, with doing some, uh, core, minimal core work, um, like breathing <laughs> really is all it was. <laughs> um, but being mindful of, of healing and, and loading, loading the core as, as little as you can like progress it slowly. So not just jumping right back into it, which, which is what I did with my first, even though I was 12 months postpartum, jumping back into it wasn't the best idea. And so being more mindful of loading slowly to build up strength so that now I can do pretty much anything that I want to do. Um, and this is, no, this is further along. I'm, I'm now eight, my youngest is 18 months. Um, and so a little further along than when I jumped back into things before, but now I can do those things without worrying about doing damage because I did do that slow rebuilding um, recovery, just like you would do for, for a knee injury or whatever. Yeah, I, I think you both brought up some some really good points in that, you know, it's so individualized, not just mm -hmm. for the person and their base level of conditioning and exercise, but also the baby is going to dictate you know, how personalized your, your plan goes after that time. Um, now there are definite situations and exercises that people should stay away from when they are pregnant and that's contact sports, right? You don't want to be playing rugby. What, Probably no? skydiving is a bad idea. Um, sports where you definitely, you know, you have a high likelihood of falling, like say skiing or something like that. I'd say those are probably a no go and maybe MMA fighting too. Um, <laughs> But for the rest of you, it, it is a, a barometer. And actually, there was just new guidelines published uh, on September 9th by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology that changed their thought process. And it's because this classic thought, even in terms of preterm labor or fetal growth uh, retardation or multiple pregnancies, um, you know, of, oh, stay off, you, you need to rest, you need to sit at home, that there's no evidence to support this. So they, they can't recommend for or against it, but they definitely can't recommend that bed rest uh, is the way to go. And in fact, a lot of their recommendations say that they recommend against strict bed rest. And it's because of a lot of the, the articles that we kind of reviewed in preparation for this. So, you know, is weight training safe? Uh, Aaron Graham, what do you think? Is weight training safe for pregnant people? I most definitely believe that weight training is safe. But as Stephanie said earlier, you have to listen to your body. Um, I'm going to tell you, being married for 16 years, a woman's intuition is amazing. A mother's intuition is on another level. So if your body's telling you, you know what, I got to slow it down. I can't push it this way as Stephanie alluded to earlier, please listen to your body. Um, are you going to go in there and are you going to be squatting, you know, your max? No, you're, you're, you're not going to do that. Um, but can you go in there and can you lift weight? Of course you can. And the benefits are proven. You know, you guys talked a lot about, you know, back pain. And that's a common thing during pregnancy. But it's actually proven that lifting weights or just working out in general during pregnancy reduces back pain. So, you know, there's so many things, um, easing constipation, for example, pregnant women, that's, that's a big deal. Constipation is a big deal. And uh, women go straight to the doctor and they're popping, you know, a stool softener like Colex. But once again, when you are active, you have more motility in your bowel. So of course that's another benefit for this. So there's so many, um, you know, you have, and in pregnancy, you have the risk of gestational diabetes. Um, you have the risk of something called preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure during pregnancy. And it's also proven that fitness exercise works to, you know, improve your chances of not having these things. So um, once again, I've never been pregnant. Um, 
you know, Stephanie and Caitlin, they, they're, they're the experts here. Uh, during your process of, of, you know, bringing women in to train them or to educate them while being pregnant, how do you start that process? Um, I usually just tell people, you know, if they come in and they tell me they're pregnant, um, I say, you know, you've been here for such and such weeks or months or whatever it's been. We're going to keep doing what you're used to doing. Um, we modify as we go, you know, and I tell them the thing about gut instinct, like if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. If you are feeling too sick and that you shouldn't come in, you know, take a rest day. It's your body wants you to rest, especially during that first trimester. Um, and I think I read somewhere that that's why we get nauseous and so fatigues because the body actually wants us to rest so that the baby can grow. Um, but yeah, I tell them, you know, we're going to take it day by day. We're going to see how you feel every day, see what hurts. And we're going to keep doing what you've always done. And if they're new and they're coming in pregnant, we start at the beginning, just like you would a brand new exerciser. You don't throw someone, you know, right into the hardest workout the first time they've ever worked out. So we just start real slow. We modify with whatever needs to be modified. I keep my eye on them. You know, as the pregnancy usually progresses, we say, okay, now it's time to maybe stop doing box jumps, but we're going to do step ups. If, if you don't have any pelvic pain, you know, or if you want to change step ups to this exercise, we'll change it to this one. You know, we're not going to do sit ups anymore, but we've got these ab exercises you can do. So we kind of just take them in and, you know, every person's different. Every pregnancy is different. So you have you got to get the feel for that person, that pregnancy, how they're feeling. And just, it's, it's really day by day. You just work with that person to make sure they feel good and that they're safe and always remind them to trust their gut on what they're doing. Yeah. I will add, I love the, I love the idea of like listening to your body and trusting your gut. Um, but it has to be a holistic picture of that. Like it can't just be that moment when you're in the gym because had I done that, I would have done, you know, lunges and whatever, because in the morning I felt great. But then as the day got on, went on, I felt the pain. And so if you are experiencing pain from something that you're doing in the gym, or even if it's not something from, that you're getting from the gym, but you can, you can tell that it's the same muscles or whatever, like you need to adjust what you're doing in the gym or working out wherever you're working out um, so that you don't have effects of it outside of that specific moment yeah. so athletes are trained to like push past pain mm -hmm. and to like you know tough it up and keep going and you'll get better um but if we have that brain when we're pregnant then we can cause additional damage so even if we're not experiencing pain or like when we're in the moment we're feeling that like athleticism we're going hard we're going strong we're feeling good um, we'd still have to be mindful of, you know, the rest of the 23 and a half hours of the day or however long you work out um, to make sure that we're not doing additional damage or, or um, have other effects from that specific moment in time, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I, you know, I think you heard it here, both um, from people that have been pregnant who train pregnant people and the evidence matches that, you know, you can kind of, depending on what the baby is wanting you to do during that time period, the evidence does show that women who continue doing exercise during pregnancy, in particular, these studies have looked at CrossFit style training uh, and moderate intensity weightlifting. Uh, actually had uh, good outcomes during their pregnancy. The babies were healthy, that healthy levels of weight gain. Um, and they had improved energy and less fatigue actually compared to the group that did not do a supervised exercise program. And by supervised, we mean having the strong figure type professionals watching you while you're doing it. In terms of high intensity interval training, it's not that it's bad for you. We just don't really have the evidence. Again, because as healthcare providers, we have the, ew, we can't take care of, you know, pregnant women. They're scary. So I think that the research just doesn't exist. And also when you're conducting clinical research, one of the big stipulations when you're trying to study pregnant women, you know, it, the, there's a lot of red tape involved in that, for, rightly so, because again, it's two human beings and the ethics involved in that are state dependent. So, it, you know, I think that that's why there's a big gap in the literature. 
Um, the British International Journal just came out with an article in, uh, a little while ago that also showed that there's less gestational diabetes and weight, uh, you know, uh, improper weight gain for women that continued moderate exercise during pregnancy. Now that said, um, you know, we're, we, we're, we're, we've talked about fitness, but what about the nutrition realm? So what is a good amount of weight gain? What's a bad amount of weight gain? You know, should, should women eat whatever they want? Are there certain foods that they should stay away from? <laughs> Stephanie. Like, oh, so let me talk. Let me talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. Uh, this one, it kind of blows my mind. Um, I, before I got pregnant with my first, um, you know, nutrition was the one thing I studied harder than anything else. Um, because it's, it's true what they say. It's like, you know, 30% gym, 70% kitchen or something like that. It's, it's so true. And I, I love to eat and I love food. And so I just study, study, study food. And when I got pregnant with my first, I was like gung ho, I'm going to be like the most nutritious eating mother. Like I am not going to eat for two. I, and you don't, that's, you do not eat for two. You, you don't even have to increase your calories until the second trimester by a couple hundred. And then the third trimester, like three to 500. And, and that's like a banana and peanut butter. So, it, you know, I know all these things, but let me tell you. When you are nauseous with morning sickness or all day sickness, which I had with Brielle for six, seven, eight weeks, and you can only stomach a cheeseburger or pizza or with my second, it was sausage biscuits. Like, <laughs> I don't know why, but I, I ate like five sausage biscuits a day. And it was the only thing that would keep me from throwing up. And I had to eat every two hours or my sickness would get worse. So it's the, it's mind blowing to me that your body is literally telling you, you're just going to eat this and you're going to deal with it until we get past this stage. So I tell every pregnant client that's ever come into my gym or anyone who's ever asked you eat whatever you need to eat and you don't worry about it during that first trimester when you're dealing with being sick, because you just, you just have to get through that period. People who don't experience morning sickness, I'm so jealous of that. Um, but it, it is terrible. It is one of the worst things ever. And you just deal with it, you get through it. Then the minute it's gone, you wake up normal again. I don't even know how to describe it. But you wake up one day, and you're like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm back to me. I'll go fix an egg and some spinach and some cauliflower. And you just go, you know, right back to healthy eating. And it was like that with both kids, really, I was less sick the second time than I was the first but I was still pretty sick. And you, you do need to eat healthy foods because you're not eating for two. You don't want to put on an excessive amount of weight. Um, it's, it's easy to do. And another thing that blows my mind with that is um, maybe despite a few weeks in the first trimester, um, I ate very healthy in the second and third trimester. I exercised five days a week throughout the second pregnancy. Um, you do put on less weight when you exercise during pregnancy versus not. I, I put on less weight with my second than my first. Um, but the body, the, a woman's body is going to do what it wants to do to grow that baby. And it, it doesn't matter how hard you try. Cause I tried so hard. I was in the gym five days a week and I ate as healthy as I could that second and third trimester. And I still put on 50 pounds and it's, you just have to be like, this is a stage of my life and my body's doing what it needs to create a healthy baby. And then we move forward after that. So yeah, you, you want to eat well, you don't want to eat for two. You don't want to have, there's so much research on, you know, not taking in too much sugar during pregnancy. Um, you want to avoid gestational diabetes. You want to avoid the high blood pressure. You, you want to eat. It's probably the most important time of your life to eat well. You know, you shouldn't be eating the cupcake because you're pregnant you know, this is the time that you are growing a human being, you can even change that your kids preferences for food, you know, and healthy eating just by what you eat during pregnancy. So I'm super passionate about that. Just know that your body is still going to do what it needs to do. Does that make sense? You know, it's, it's really Definitely. important to exercise. It's really important to eat well. You still need to give your body some grace and let it do what it needs to do to grow that baby for you. Caitlin, did you have a similar experience? Um, I, 
I gained like the, the average, the normal, um, for both of mine. Um, but I didn't have the, like my morning sickness was totally different from Steph's. Um, I could still eat fairly healthy. Um, as long as I just ate frequently, I didn't have any cravings for specific foods that made it feel better or anything. Um, so as long as I kept a cracker or something in my purse at all times, I was okay. Um, I just, yeah, when, the moment that I had any kind of nauseous feeling, if I ate something, I was fine. If I didn't eat something, I would throw up. So that's, I mean, yeah, like Steph said, you can do things totally. And even actually with my second, I, I did crave a lot of like carbs. <laughs> um, I'm gluten free. And so that's not something that I eat a ton. Um, and I just started buying things that I don't buy normally, um, because I wanted them and, <laughs> and my body did not respond the way that Steph's did with her pregnancies. I did not gain a ton of weight, um, even though she ate healthy. And that's probably why my son now just devours carbs and sweets and, wants nothing to do with anything else. <laughs> so whoops. <laughs> no, I have. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny how you can be, I mean, I still ate healthy. Um, I make it sound like I didn't, but um, you can be very mindful of things and your body is still does what it needs to do. Um, does what it wants, you know, during this time. And it's, you can't really do anything about it. Yeah. They're they're. Oh, go ahead. You know, it's uh, two things, actually, that, that has to just do with, um, you know, a woman's body is going to do, as Stephanie and as Caitlin said, what it needs to do to grow this baby. Um, let's, let's be honest here. You're, you're, you're growing, you know, toes, you're growing arms, you're growing legs. Your body's going to have cravings. And it's okay to give in to those cravings every, every now and then. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, your body's going through a lot. Once again, kudos to women because I, I just don't understand and cannot fathom the process of, you know, making, making this baby grow inside of you. Yes, yeah, science tells us all about it, but I can't, I can't even, it's, if you don't believe in miracles, you'll, I mean, just watch what a woman has to go through. And that is, that is a miracle in itself. Um, another thing I want to touch on is you guys both talked morning sickness. Now, there's regular morning sickness, and there's morning sickness that goes above and beyond normal. Um, I think that's hyperemesis gravidarium. Um, and basically with that, you really should be very cautious um, and speak to your, you know, your healthcare provider if you have prolonged morning sickness or if you notice that you are losing an excess amount of weight during pregnancy, because it is a very serious condition. Dr. Mott? Yeah, I mean, there are numerous reasons why women can feel nauseous during pregnancy. The hyperemesis gravidarum is definitely like to the nth degree nausea and vomiting. And that often will also cause liver abnormalities as well with it, um, mostly during first trimester. Um, and that mechanism is not known, really. But estrogen and progesterone, again, here to attack your body, right? So the reason why reflux is worse is because progesterone will directly open up the barrier that you have called the lower esophageal sphincter. That's like the doorway between your esophagus and your stomach. Also, estrogen is kind of like a kill switch for your intestinal motility and you have a baby occupying the space, right? So, you know, you have a doorway that's open going up and the way out is tough. So naturally anything that goes in is gonna go the, the path of least resistance and that's back into your mouth. The other effect is in my world, which is the bile ducts, you know, your whole motility of your gallbladder is slowed down. And also the motility, the ability to empty that bile, bile breaks down fat in your diet, that's delayed going into your intestine too. So you can't empty as much bile to break down fat in your diet. But yet another reason why people feel nauseated. Um, there are a few things that I will say that pregnant women need to make sure that they're having nutritionally, and that's folic acid. Um, because especially in the early phases, when you're wiring up that baby brain, you need folic acid to build the piping, to build that healthy brain. If you don't, babies can get what's called neurotube defects, which are kind of holes in that neuropiping. So folic acid, really important. 
take vitamins, but also folic acid is available in most things that are green. Um, so lots of vegetables helpful if you can stomach them. The healthy amount of weight gain for pregnancy, if you're underweight, is about 28 to 40 pounds. If you're normal weight, the recommendation is around 25 to 30 pounds, 35 pounds. Overweight says 25, uh, 15 to 25 pounds, and then obese is 11 to 20 pounds. So those are the recommendations, but we all know the baby's going to do what it wants. And we talked about this on podcast too. Is weight a good metric? Probably not, right? Because just because you're gaining weight doesn't mean that that's not the baby growing. You're retaining more water. You know, it, it, you're not you're gaining muscle because you're also lifting through pregnancy. I think it's, again, just showing that there are limitations within the science itself. But we latch on to these things because that's all we know as doctors. Um, you know, moving away from nutrition, and then we talked about the being pregnant part. We, we have some experts here also in the postpartum part of pregnancy. And this is the time period when movement is vital, right? Because you're recovering, but also your blood is kind of stagnant. So you have a very high risk of blood clots. Caitlin, how do you approach people that want to get back into the gym or want to start a program after pregnancy? I think you have some special certifications in that area even. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess I'm a certified postnatal fitness specialist. Um, but, you know, you just like with pregnancy, you take them where they're at. Um, so you want to start minimal and then work from there. But every, every person can progress at a different level. So there's somebody that might have to take a lot of time to do those breathing exercises, um, diaphragmatic breathing, transverse abdominus contractions are really huge in the beginning to um, re-engage the core because of that um, separation that may have happened, um, working those deep core muscles. Uh, and so some people may, some women may have um, need to do that a, a lot longer of a time um, to rebuild. And other people may be able to progress through that a lot faster, build up to things a lot quicker, um, and then get back to, you know, the standard normal gym workouts that they're used to um, before. Um, so really, it's, you know, you have to take everyone individually. Um, I mean, there are programs out there that say, you know, week one, do this, week two, do this, week three, do this. And those are all fine and dandy, but it's kind of taking the general approach, um, the safe, the safe route. And so, um, yeah, you can kind of individualize it as well. Steph, anything to add to that? I mean, Caitlin is my go-to for this sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a lot of, I think my biggest issue with it is so many people just they come to me and they say, I need to get my body back. And I, I hate that. Um, they just want to start moving. They want to start jumping. They want to start doing all of these things. Um, there's so much work on the inside that needs to be done and addressed. And it's frustrating when people want to just bypass that and they just want to move. And I guess I understand when you work out and you get that sweat, you feel really good. Like you did something. It doesn't feel as good as laying on the floor and doing those transverse abdominal contractions. Um, but more people need to understand that there's a process to get back to what you were doing before. Um, because if not, you end up with all of these issues. I, after I had real, I had no clue. My first, I had no clue that it actually took your pelvic floor up to two years to recover from childbirth. No clue. I thought, Oh, six week checkup. I can go back to the gym. I didn't. I, I was, took me way longer, but at about five or six months postpartum, I went back to powerlifting and my, my organs just dropped. I was, I, I remember picking up a barbell. I was deadlifting and I was like, this did not feel right. And it just went downhill from it because I didn't know what was happening. And I, I think it was Caitlin that convinced me to go see a pelvic floor physical therapist, which I believe every single woman after having a baby needs to do. Um, and, you know, I went and I saw the specialist and, you know, I had a minor prolapse, but I also was experiencing incontinence issues when I was trying to jump rope, um, which it's, it blows my mind how many women will come into the gym and they'll just be like, well, I had X number amount of babies. I can't jump or I can't run. And they just chalk it up to, I had babies. So I can't do this. And uh, Caitlin and I, we try to tell everyone who comes in, yeah, yeah, you can just, just go get some 
physical therapy and, and you'll be fine. And, and I spent about eight sessions in physical therapy and um, we, I got past the incontinence issue when, when jumping rope and with my second pregnancy, I went to PT right away. Like I got right at the six week mark. I just went straight to PT and we worked for 10 weeks because um, I had adductor muscles that were too tight. My calum sat so low that my thigh muscles were holding up my organs. Um, so I had to have PT done on my thighs basically because they were so tight. It was causing a pulling sensation when I tried to run. So deep down, I just felt like this just pull. I didn't know what it was, but you know, physical therapy, she said, Oh, your muscles are just really tight from holding that baby up. And we spent about 10 weeks working them out. And I feel so incredibly better. Yeah. You know, so much better. Um, after having those sessions and being cleared from PT and getting back into exercise that way. So everything Caitlin said, like, take it slow. You have to start with breathing. You have to rebuild your core, but also see a, a PT, see a specialized PT and just get an evaluation of what's really going on down there. Because I mean, it takes two years to really recover from childbirth and not enough people know that. Yeah. There are other countries that that's like their, like after you have your six week checkup or what, they're like, okay, here's your referral. Go, go next door to this place. Like it's not even part of, it's not a separate appointment. It's like, okay, now walk down this, down the hallway to this uh, public floor physical therapist and get, get inspected there because they do so like your um, OBGYN or your midwife or whoever only knows so much. The physical therapist can, can evaluate so much more um, and help you in the, the process of recovery where, where your midwife and OBGYN don't have that expertise. Um, so th to them, it looks great, but you may have a little bit more work to do um, in order to really be able to get back to the gym. Yeah. Gratitude for both of you for those, you know, really wholehearted stories. And, you know, I appreciate the honesty, uh, Stephanie, with, with your experience. As you know, Katie, my wife is a female uh, pelvic reconstructive surgeon. So this is what she does every day. We talk about this all the time. Um, you can imagine what our dinner conversations are like. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, incontinence and prolapse are kind of like the dirty secret. People don't want to talk about it because they feel embarrassed. You know, they, they don't want to get examined by a doctor because they're embarrassed to, to, to be examined. And so in my world, a lot of people will come with fecal incontinence. They don't actually say that. They'll say diarrhea, but you have to kind of coax that out of them. And it's a very common problem. Um, and yes, uh, biofeedback and pelvic reconditioning takes time. And add on something like a, a, a big baby or a traumatic childbirth where they have to do, you know, a cut called an episiotomy or a vacuum delivery. And you can really damage the nerves and muscles down there. And it takes a lot of work to come back and sometimes surgery for sure. Um, Aaron Graham, you want to just summarize our topic and then we'll move on to a break and then listener mail. Uh, so what we've been talking about today with uh, Stephanie and Caitlin um, is exercise during pregnancies, the benefits, how to do it, when to do it, why to do it. Uh, we've also touched base on the importance of uh, nutrition during pregnancy. Um, and I have learned so much as I always do with our guests. Um, there's so much uh, more questions I have for you. I wish we had more time. I hope that we can have you guys back on uh, to talk about some other things with uh, women's health and fitness. So this one, we're going to go to a commercial break. All right. And uh, we're back from our commercial break. The first piece of listener mail is from Carly. And she asks, uh, what do you think is longest lasting, low fat or low carb? Caitlin, you want to leave this one off? Honestly, I don't feel like I have the expertise to know um, how to even answer that. Stephanie? Um, I, I just want to say neither and find something more sustainable that lasts long term. Um, but that's because I've been there and I've done all those things. I've tried all the diets, the low carb, the low fat, the, the paleo, the keto, the I went vegan for one week. That's all I could handle it. Um, but I've, <laughs> I've tried it all. And what it comes down to is you have to find a way that is going to be sustainable long-term because every diet will work for a little bit and every diet eventually fails. And you have to figure out how to live your life happily with a good balance. 
So I, I work with my clients on, on finding that balance and how to live and make healthy choices every day while not necessarily going completely low carb or low fat. Um, I definitely would say fat is good and carbs. You can, if you have to, you can cycle carbs. Um, you can have some low carb days and some high carb days. It depends on what your workouts look like, how active you are. Um, I say fat is great. Cycle your carbs, but honestly find what works for the long term and what makes you happy. And that's going to be more sustainable. All right, Graham. I would definitely agree. Sustainability. It's, you have to know what works for you. And that's something I always preach, you know, just because, you know, Dr. Mark or myself says something doesn't mean it's going to work for you. I mean, Stephanie hit it on the, on the nose, you know? Um, of course, I'm, I'm all about healthy fats, you know, um, they work, they work for me, but so does carb cycling, uh, you know, especially when I am in that, you know, real fitness mode, I do carb cycle from time to time. Um, and there's definitely benefits to that too. But, you know, really, honestly, sustainability. Um, is there a need to do either? Uh, no, not really. Um, but, you know, Doc Mock, you're, you're a nutrition guy. What, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I think we have group consensus here. You know, um, I would say pick something that is neither low carb nor low fat and pick something that is sustainable that you can do for the rest of your life. That said, if you want to go comparing one versus the other, if I have to pick my poison, um, red pill, blue pill, I'm going to go with the low carb pill just because the scientific evidence um, points more towards benefit with like a ketogenic sort of process. And you can honestly, you can eat a lot of volume of carbohydrate in vegetables with not a lot of macro carbohydrate volume, you know, like three cups of the good vegetables that are, you know, relatively good glycemic index is about 15 grams of carbs. And if you have that three times a day, you're still, you know, under the, the levels that would be considered low carbohydrate. So, so I think we have group consensus here. The next one I think is going to be more a me question. And that's from David. How can I detox my liver? Um, is anybody wait, wait, wait. in the group? Can, can I say something? Sure. Don't drink. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say, is anybody toxing their liver these days in, in the group? Um, you know, I, I've been on a journey to kind of stop drinking over the last year and a half. I feel amazing. You know, you sleep like you're in high school again. It's, it's amazing what one alcoholic beverage will do to your sleep. Um, that said, the liver's job is to detox your body. And it is very good at doing that. And it is a very resilient organ. You know, a lot of people will know that uh, in order to get scar tissue in the liver, you have to have a lot of your liver percentage down. Roughly about 90% of your liver will be down before it really is permanently damaged. And I've even seen alcoholics who are on death's door waiting for a transplant who get better and they go back to being a normal person just from stopping drinking. Um, that said, you know, the best way to detox your liver, you know, step one, avoid alcohol. Um, and we actually wrote an article on this recently. Step two, uh, I would say limit or get rid of sugars uh, and added sugars to your diet. Stay under about 25 to 50 grams, which is roughly about two apples worth of sugar. Um, one Starbucks espresso drink, like Frappuccino, that's your whole day of sugar. Like that's your whole, whole daily allowance of sugar. Yeah. <laughs> um, you want to stick with uh, better glycemic carbohydrates. So avoiding simple carbohydrates like pasta, rice, and bread, because you're going to hold all of that extra simple carb in the liver in the form of storage, which is fat. Um, and then apart from that, you know, there are things that you can try the gut microbiome uh, most of the bacteria in there will get filtered at some point in time if a few of them break loose in your intestine by the liver. And so keeping your gut microbiome healthy is a part of this as well. Don't buy one of those store-bought, you know, processed sort of like detox programs. Usually it's a combination of a laxative, usually magnesium. It will just make you poop your brains out so you think it's working. It'll have olive oil so you can absorb something. 
and then it'll have usually turmeric, which I, I totally am with turmeric. Like that's got good scientific evidence. And then this mishmash of just like bro sciencey stuff, um, which I, I've reviewed all the literature. I've looked at naturopathic. I've looked at functional medicine papers on this, and it, it just doesn't match up. And acetylcysteine can help sometimes, but you know, again, if you're doing the rest of the things, you probably can just let your liver do its work. This has been a wonderful time, and I thank you both uh, for taking the time out of your busy training schedule and your boot camp to uh, speak with RN Graham and myself. And RN Graham, of course, thank you for taking time in the middle of saving lives to, to talk with us today. Um, we can find you guys on some really exciting new things coming to Strong Figure. So tell us a little bit more about that before we go. Uh, you can find us right now, strongfigure.com backslash maximal being. So everything that we have for you guys and, uh, you know, to thank you for being our listeners. Um, we've got that there for you. Um, Caitlin and I just launched um, an at-home bootcamp program. And you can actually find that at strongfigure.com. It just at the top of the page says join our bootcamp. Um, and you'll see videos that we're putting together for you guys. You'll see our kids running around in the background and, uh, we're just trying to make everyone as fit as we possibly can, especially now with COVID and everyone staying at home and working out and, and building their garage gyms and all. So yeah, strongfigure.com. Find us there. Yeah. The boot camps are definitely worth uh, a gander. I, I certainly have done them during COVID and, and definitely will leave you, um, wanting to get hydrated and wanting you to eat a lot afterwards. Aaron Grimm, what's going on in our world these days? Well, it's the usual over here at Maximal Being. Um, you know, of course, check us out on our website, MaximalBeing.com. Uh, you can also check us out at Maximal underscore Being on IG, as well as um, our Twitter. You can find us at Maximal Being. Um, you know, we have our usual fitness and training programs, um, as well as our nutritional packages. So jump aboard the website, check those things out. And once again, Caitlin, Stephanie, thank you very much for coming on today. Dot Mop. Yeah, so uh, tune in next time, Maximal Beings. We love uh, talking to you all. Send us an email at team at Maximal Being. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them on the podcast. And until next time, this is Doc Mock with RN Graham, Stephanie, and Caitlin with strongfigure.com. And we're here to maximize your pathway to wellness. Next week on the Maximal Being Podcast. And what is the difference between a cheap meal and a cheap day? Um, so to me, a cheap meal is that one meal I get once a week where I can splurge a little bit, kind of reward myself. Now, there are scientifically proven reasons why this meal is actually very beneficial for you. It's in fact, it's sometimes needed, especially. Do us a favor, Maximal Beings, and leave us a comment or review. Hit the subscribe button and let your friends and family know so that we can get the word out. And until next time, this is Doc Mock, and I'm here to maximize your pathway to wellness.